Thanks for listening to this Word in Your Ear podcast. If you'd like to get early access to all our productions ad-free, priority booking for our live events, and to take part in our weekly quiz, go to patreon.com slash wordinyourear for more details. Welcome to another Word in Your Ear, and this is about a uh, fantastic uh, memoir, an expanded edition, in fact, of a fantastic memoir about growing up in London's East End in the 60s and 70s and about various musical adventures, including uh, being part of the punk rock inner circle and uh, and two years in Public Image Limited, uh, a modern morality tale, as it's described in the foreword. And uh, this is the author, the great Jar Wobble. Lovely to see you, John, as we shall call you. How are you doing? Lovely to be here, fellas. Lovely to be talking to you. Great. Well, look, this came out originally, I think, in 2009. So have you, obviously, you've added stuff after 2009, but have you adjusted anything before that? I expanded on a few things. Brexit, maybe, maybe that was a mistake. To, I didn't bang on about it, but obviously Brexit's a major big deal that happened, tied in with some of the um, blue collar disaffection that I discussed in, uh, in 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 the original book. So I thought this has gone further down a certain road, you know, blue collar working class disaffection. So that you know. I needed to address that. I felt hopefully I haven't overdone it because you do sort of think with politics, it changes in, in a week anyway. You can put yourself out a day quicker than you could do writing about music possibly. But there's a few little things expanded actually um, earlier on, but hopefully I've kept the terse sort of, you know, kept it quite pared down. I did have an import, the editor, Ian Priest, lovely guy he wanted he wanted to cut it down you know we had the, those discussions authors have with editors and um and I, I, when we'd finished the whole program and I, I had to stand my corner and um when we'd when we'd finished it he sent me his book and i thought i've never seen such a big book in fact i should have put this the, the phone on it because it's <laughs> massive and uh, it, it's, it's twice the length for war and peace and i thought it's a melody, <laughs> getting me to, you know. But it, lovely guy, and it's just a funny story. I've never, so my editor did the, the thickest, biggest book I've ever seen, you know. But well, anyway, look, tell, us, tell us just a little bit about you. It's really fascinating, all the stuff about you growing up in Stepney and E14. And just just give us some idea of, you know, what your parents E1, did. E1, E14's popular. I grew up in Stepney, E1. E1. So, but, but, but funny enough, the first postcode I lived in, as a very young baby in Loxley Street was E14. That's right, so, Loxley Street. So, uh, yeah, so, and then I, so I grew up in E1, we moved to Smithy Street. White working class, you know, it, it was not too dissimilar, I'm sure, to growing up in Newcastle or Salford, in essence. Um, strong Roman Catholic element, you know, we were very religious people um, from the Irish ancestry, so they'd come over from Ireland with the religion. So my dad's brother, was a priest, a Catholic priest. My mum's side of the family was really the Irish one, solidly Irish out of Cork. Um, so you had a pre-Vatican II Catholicism, which is quite hardcore. You know, it's a very different world. I mean, it's kind of was in, in obviously all, in the fifties, in the, the, the some way off the twenty-first century. But actually, in terms of attitude, and I look back at it, it was closer, to, much closer to the nineteenth century. <laughs> than we are now in terms of thinking. So really a, a very different world, you know. Did you have a kind of romantic world. attachment to it? You talk about the, the pickling factories and the seafood stores and the Docklands and all that. Did you feel a sort of romantic sort of uh, connection with it? I think it's okay to feel romantic about stuff, but you mustn't fix things too much in life because everything's always shifting and moving. I think the biggest mistake people make, and I've done this, is to try to, to to work a secure position, you know, a secure, stable position. And not, no such a thing really exists in life. Life's very fragile, likely to change at any moment. From moment to moment, it changes. So you enjoy it. But as my mate Billy used to say, I mentioned in the book, he used to say, go through life like a tourist. And, you know, which is like, yeah. yeah, so you go through, oh, look, at what's this? Oh, that's not, you know, you're just not too attached to stuff, you know. What was your first involvement with music? Well, it's funny. So I got I got asked on a on another podcast to name my 
favorite bits of uh, favorite bits of music and first bits of music. And the first music was da 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 da, da which I forgot da, what da, it was. Da, I da. thought I thought it was Animal Magic, but it's the Joe Loss Orchestra. Right. So that's the very first tune that I liked. That I drove annoyed all everyone because I'd get up at five thirty in the morning. It wasn't too long before I started going to bed at 5.30 in the morning, but I'm up at 5.30 as a little toddler singing that song, really annoying everybody, waking everyone up singing that song. The first single I had bought for me by my mum was um, Jim Reeves, Welcome to my world. Because right. yeah, yeah. all the Irish loved all the other They did, Reeves, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like the Jamaicans as well, actually. You'd always see... Yes, Jim Reeves and Perry Como records in Jamaican shops. Quite you, would, you would, you yeah. would, <laughs> yeah. That, and Frank said they liked all the crooners, you know, Tony Bennett and everything, but particularly Jim Reeves. And but the first track I went for was Bell Wives. That was the first thing I want that record. And so at Paul's record stall outside Whitechapel Station, or what they used to call Whitechapel Waste, they used to sell. They was at the Blue Beat Chart which mirrored pretty much the, the top 40 chart anyway, you know, the pop stuff, but instrumental, lots of instrumental versions of, and reggae versions of tracks that was in the top 40. Um, and he used to do lots of great soul, seven inches and this, that and the other. Anyway, I got the Bell Ives record. Where he would, I would have heard him play it and said, I want that. And that I love that record as well. So I think what? that was kind of, um, what were they called? Is it Skiffle? I think it's kind of Skiffle yeah. style, you know. So what, you're what, obsessed what, with strawberry fields, weren't you? You're talking about at the age of eight, I think. Ah, well, that's a, yeah, that's very. But so I didn't like the Beatles. Just as a kid, I didn't really like them. They were doing yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, she loves you, yeah. And all the all the little girls at primary school would sing it. Something about them I didn't like. So I had this observing witness thing about me somehow. This this you know that would turn me nose up things in life was a bit you know precious maybe even no one really knew that side but I would be observing things and I just knew I didn't really like that and they all thought that they loved the Beatles so all the community around me thought they were good nice working class clean well cut young men great stuff then Yoko Ono got involved and they didn't like that really you know this eastern temptress and they liked John Lennon. They felt he was being corrupted somehow by Yoko Ono. And they felt they're all on drugs. They're all on drugs. So they turned against them. And then they did Strawberry Fields. And people, would they thought that was horrible music. That was weird. And I was like, oh, this does something to me. Now we've you started. <laughs> this, this I love, you know. Um, and it was magical. And I just couldn't. It was like a magical thing. I couldn't understand what was going on with this sound that was just you couldn't articulate. Mm. It just made it made me feel wonderful. You know, it was a wonderful thing, and there was something really truly deep going on. You know, <laughs> they were also very much against the Rolling Stones, which I talk about in the book. We had a, a when yeah, we your dad Smith shouting Street, at the telly when Jagger's on top. Shouting at the telly, yeah, Jagger and me uncle John and me mum's brother Jagger came on and. It was Johnny was shouting more. My old man was quite a cold, detached guy, you know, El Alamein veteran. Johnny was talking about they should be shot. And my dad, he just said, I'll use them for mine clearance. And you are talking about a guy that's been at El Alamein, <laughs> saw some stuff. He knows he, what he's, he's actually, talking about. <laughs> he, he's not mucking about. He wants to see Mick Jagger out in a minefield with Keith Richard with a bayonet poking down the German mines, you know. <laughs> so when did you start with the bass? Um, got hold of a, I think probably the first time was in the Warwick Road squats where you had Sid Vicious, Keith Levine, um, Viv Albertine, they were all there. Yet again, I had that rather, it's funny, this snobby side, I've never talked about this, I had a rather disapproving, so the way I was with the Beatles early doors, I was rather disapproving, you know, because I was more like the guy, the Edward Fox character in performance, you know, you go into a, a den of what I saw as hippies, people that needed to see soap and water, <laughs> I thought I thought their personal hygiene left a lot to be desired, and I was I was quite looking down my nose at them, you know, um, to be honest. But Sid was there; there was a bass there, so I would have played the bass for the first time there and felt very at home with it. I kind of knew what you could do with it, what you should do with it, you know. Right? Is it? Uh, sorry, jumping ahead here because it just interests me listening to so many of your records. I mean, is is recording the bass 
a difficult thing? I don't think it is. Um, people, I've had it so much. How'd you get your bass sound? It's like, well, I turn all the treble off, basically, in essence, plug it in and make it quite loud. <laughs> Obviously, the phrasings, you know, how you, you, you want, you know, do you want a more percussive feel or do you want really soft feel? The, the strings you're playing, are they, are they round wound? Are they flat wound? Are they nylon? If they're, if they're flat wound and they're nylon, you'll have a, you won't have much attack on it. If it's round wound, you'll have a little bit of a clink. You'll have, you'll have that fender precision thing going on um, with the top end, actually, which defines the line. And that's why I wouldn't have done the bass lines I did with Public Image on any other bass than a fender, especially a fender precision. It's got a certain sound, you know. Um, you can make it as involved as you like. So early doors, I put a lot more effort into recording the bass than I do now. We would have um, three different amps or three different mics set up. So we'd have an amp, we'd have a DI, we'd have a direct amp signal. That's two channels. And then three mics. And we'd have a bass track room, you know, which was good for you, low ceiling. And what you would do, if you were doing a bass line around G, you'd find the part of the room that really resonated in G, just with trial and error, you know, and you get an incredible sort of bass sound. The great well, there's thing so much some, science involved in this, isn't there? Well, the great, but the great thing is that with the with the advent of technology, you, you can now use a bass pod, and I like these pods, Great British Bass, and I'm not that much of an ego guy that, you know, had such an effect on music, but they're definitely influenced by the public image limited bottom end that I had at that time. So you get these pods, you'll you have this list of plugins, you know, amps, and you'll have, it right. might as well say jar wobble bass. Yeah. It's got that, that, that they've, they've, they've got that imprinted sound that I've developed with those mics, just in a pod now, bang, you can have it like that. It's the same way with YouTube, where you could go to India and spend many, many years in ashrams until the guru whispered the secret of enlightenment in your ear or your own personal mantra. You just go on YouTube now and some American geezer will enlighten you. <laughs> it's all there. The same as if you want to know how to put a filter into an Amazon Basics Hoover, you go to YouTube. So it's, it's all reduced to information yeah. now. Yeah. I don't mind it. I don't feel hard done. People say, you must feel hard done by it. That you, I said, no, it's fantastic. It just means I can do what I want to do 20 times quicker. So I'm happy not fiddling around with mics everywhere. Don't need to do that anymore. Yeah, yeah. Because, because we've done it in the past. So we don't need to, um, you know, go on a sailing ship, you know, to America yeah. anymore because it's just all – in fact, because we've got Zoom, we don't need to go anywhere anymore, actually. <laughs> as we're finding. As we're finding. Yeah. Just, uh, just one. On. I was going to just one, just one punk rock question. Actually, there's a brilliant bit where you, you see the first Pistols rehearsal. Did you feel watching them that 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 was going to go somewhere? That that was going to take off? What I really felt. I remember that day he told me. So I'm, you know, this guy with a, as we've established, quite a snobby, detached there, judging everybody. I'm a judgmental kind of witness to it all. But I would hide that and pretend to, you know be very jokey and, and banterish but I do have an empathy with people I can't help it so when John told me I'm in a band first of all I thought what the hell was he talking about because nobody was in bands working class boys in those days but when he told me do you want to come and see us rehearse I thought he can't be a singer this would be rubbish but when I go there it's obviously I kind of knew it's going to mean something to him so I mustn't say anything rude I've just got to be ready to go. Yeah, it's fantastic. Knowing it's rubbish. It's going to be terrible. How can he be in a band? It's going to be mental. Got there and they were fantastic. I mean, I was just, wow, you know, John was very shy. They were fantastic. The one who really stood out was Glenn Matlock as the proper musician. And he was a little bit the one, the most taciturn of them at that point. I get on with Glenn. I know him, you know, he's a nice, he's a good guy. He's very direct straightforward guy um but i found him a bit taciturn a little bit awkward i thought we come he come out of that sex pistols um danny boyle series badly by the way you know it wasn't really fair on yeah, it, but it's it's a dramatization so you know i did enjoy it but he didn't 
that certain people weren't portrayed the way they should be or they weren't portrayed at all. But anyway, he's a good guy. He really impressed me. I come to realise, you know, even at that time, I was listening to the faces, small faces. He's a kind of Ronnie Lane type bass player. You know, these McCarthy, these wonderful, they invert the chords. They do all kinds of imaginative, the melodic things that make hit records rather than just being like, but why I didn't like Sid's style of bass at the Warwick Road squat. You know, just the root chord of the, of, of the guitar, you know, really, you know, there's some imagination and verb. And I don't know, the British seem to produce these wonderful melodic rock players more than any other nation, you know, Jack Bruce, you know, etc. Yeah, yeah. There's a lovely bit where you describe seeing the, uh, Bob Marley and the Whalers, I think, at the at the Lyceum, which, Dave, you would have been there, actually. I was there. Yeah. And you were talking about, it's a really nice analogy, you were saying how the Barrett brothers had this sense of space between them and this solid foundation, but a sense of space and exploration. Which, and you made this analogy that was very like football players. I thought that was very yeah, original. Have, yeah, they have space. To, you know, the great players develop space. Right now, we're supposedly going through this golden age of football with this pressing game where actually everyone's, all the players are doing what they're told not to do as schoolboys, which is all chase the ball chase together. The ball. Yes, yeah. Sure. yeah. Yeah. They're all chasing <laughs> the ball together. And at some point in about 10 years, I think we'll look back at this period of football and think, well, wasn't that mad? All it's the a dark age. Yeah. The, it was actually just, it was just actually just mad, you know. I like the number 10s, the Glenn Hoddles, the Perlows, the players who have a bit of time and space. And Fa- Aston Family Man Barrett, they, I think that's what I picked up from watching him that night. It was just incredible for me. I mean, as you remember, David, it was, the you know, scene was notorious for having a bad sound. It was yes. difficult to, to have a good sound there. I remember seeing a few shows where the band, you could hear the band were great, but the sound was awful. But that night, somehow, he it's had the power of jar behind him. It was just the best sound I ever heard there by Mark. Yeah, it was. And Aston Family Man Barrett, he had that musical thing. You listen to a lot of Bob's songs, there's in a major key, you know, and yet they could become too sweet. And the bass is the way Aston Family Man Barrett would move through the chords. He had an incredible musicality that a lot of other bass players don't have, as well as having weight in his bass. There was an incredible musicality there, you know. You you put a re- I've got to ask you this. You you put a record out last year called The Bus Routes of South London. Yeah. So tell us about you and London Transport. <laughs> oh well when I had my demise, as lots of sad minor celebrities do, my self-obsessed, ghastly childish phase of drinking and drugging so much and then stopping. So I stopped. Best thing I ever done. Because I was an arsehole. You know, let's make no, you know, if, if you forget the romantic Hemingway, yes, you become a idiot, you know, basically. Stopped. Ended up on the underground. Loved it. Didn't resent it at all. Um, I went on the speaker system at Tower Hill. Well, on Station. the underground, you're talking about you were working for the underground, weren't you? I was working for the underground, yeah. 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 So I, I was a, became a, uh, I was station staff where you're basically manning the barriers, making sure everyone gives their 50 pence bit. So, yeah, the ticket. So, you That's did it in the stuff. days of cash money? You did it in the days of cash money. And some, not all, but many of the people I worked with were more keen to get 50 pences off of people, if you follow my drift, than yeah. they were the actual tickets. They didn't they seem to care about the tickets. Hardly. <laughs> 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 they seem very keen to get revenue for the company in terms of getting the 50 pences. And I'm sure all those 50 pence, I do remember there were one or two convictions back then, um, if memory serves me, or people not um, apportioning the 50 pences correctly in some way or whatever. <laughs> very vague about that, but that's apparently what happened. Anyway, so I was at Tower Hill one day. I was on a district and pick to start with. And I went to, it was rush hour. It was a little bit up the wall, not terrible, but it only takes a five minute delay and the platforms are really full. And I was just feeling great. It's all so surreal. I'm working on suddenly when I'm sober, I'm loving it. And I go to the wall and I do the intercom and I say, I used to be somebody. I used to, I repeat, I used to be somebody. No one said, what the fuck, you know what? 
well, you go, you know, it just, uh, there was a kind of swaying. I looked down, the, it was just a sort of swaying and people just looking, you know. Then again, I worked with a guy on the Bakerloo Jubilee when I went on the trains driver who used to announce, um, you know, um, Neesden as Rio de Janeiro and all he changed, he like Brazilian cities. So he would just say, you know, this is Rio de Janeiro, this is no one, he ever got in trouble. And, you know, in those days, I think you could punch an area manager and still not get sacked. It was a good old Yeah, yeah in those days, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So you you worked on the uh, you worked on the underground. Do you, you work on the buses as well? No, uh, no, I didn't. No, you wouldn't want me driving a bus. I don't think. <laughs> um, but uh, but no, you're I, into, I, I, you're yeah, in, but I did. I, I drove the because you wouldn't. I become a guard and you have to learn to drive. So I was up for my motorman's papers, as I call it, driver when I left. You know, um, and I, and the only reason I left, I ended up at at, um, at depot. I didn't like, and so I ended up leaving it. I still missed the job. I loved it there. I actually felt at home there. I really like people generally. I like it's a great the, the company as they call it is the best company to work for. The London Underground was wonderful. Great employer, I think. You know. So how long um, are you how long are you there for? A bit over a year or so. Right. You know, I moved okay. through the car very quickly. And you know, you'd had to wait a long time to do moments, but, but somehow, because in the Northern Line, there was a thing on the North, there was a sort of drivers, it was all getting rushed, you know, um, where you were. So you had to start driving anyway, but I wasn't far off. There was just a little window there where I, was, I would have become a driver, I think, within a year or so, you know. Right. Um, you know, but you had to do regular driving. So you were driving every as part of the deal, you had to drive every few days, you know, you'd be driving. So that was one of my biggest buzzes. It was as big a buzz as playing Glastonbury, and I mean it as well, because, you know, there I am at Stratford Station, and there's a guy saying, right, okay, you know, engage to, you know, take the brakes off and off you go. And so I'm, and it's quite a fast stretch of line going westbound between Stratford and Mile End. And I'm like, wow, you know, going through all them green lights. I remember the bloke saying, oh, right, come, <laughs> slow it down, slow it down a bit, slow it down, you know, because I'm going over the limit. And, you know, I'm I'm doing that funny, got that funny Woo! horn on top, sounding the horn when I shouldn't do, going through the stations, upset one or two of the instructors, you know, um, just for, for fun. And in those days, you might remember in those days, you would inexplicably see a train ground to a halt halfway down a platform. You might, yes. you, that used to happen. Yeah. And I, I used to wonder what, 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 why are they doing that? And what it was, it, they're testing the brake, they had a backup system to the brakes called Western House Brake. So you had to learn to judge, you applied it, and then it might take half, like maybe half a mile to really kick in. So you had to know exactly where to apply it. There's a real skill to it. If you got it wrong and come up short, You'd have to recharge the air in the train before you could move again. So commuters would often, I mean, what's this guy stopping halfway down the platform? That, but that was better than overshooting. No, sure. That's, that's, you don't want to overshoot. That could cause all sorts of issues. So anyway, that was just well, a little, little weird. It was a Kafkaesque world. When I went, to, you got, at those days, you went to the Wood Lane over the road to the BBC. That's where the, uh, the, the underground school was. And you had these guys that were kind of faux kind of sergeant major types. So they'd say to you something along the lines of, Mr. Brown, you're out on the furthest eastern regions of the central line, and a gorgeous young woman has dropped her handbag on the tracks, and she comes to see you. It's a little tiny station. You're right out there near Debden, you know, on the east side. So what do you do? Are you going to be a wuss? Are you going to phone into the controller and bother him about a, a handbag? Or are you going to be a man, jump down there and retrieve her handbag for her? Please tell me. And the bloke goes, well, I'll jump down. No, you bloody won't. <laughs> no, you don't, mate. <laughs> no, you bloody won't. You will get on the phone to the controller and you call him, dock it. Of course, no one but you... You, you learn what you really are going to do and not do. They just want to take a bit of paper or to do, you know, insurance, I guess, you know, just to say you've been you've been told. But then they'd say that, that bloke would sit there red-faced, he'd be in trouble, and then they'd go to the next bloke, Mr. Smith, you're at a station, you know, there's, um, there's a light bulb needs changing and it's about six foot from the floor. Do you change it yourself or do you fold a controller? And, of course, he thinks, well, 
I better phone the controller and tell them there's a light bulb. I'd I phone into maintenance. No, you bloody won't, you lazy son. You'll change that light bulb yourself, you know. So it's all this, of course. If it's one inch above six foot, you change that. No, you bloody won't. But that case, you will phone maintenance. You know, it was, it was fantastic. It's like being in the army. I loved it. <laughs> That's very yeah, yeah, it was. It was. I loved it. I mean, and it was a trip for me because I've been in Peel. I left Peel and actually worked with Can. I've worked with Holger and Jackie. So, you know, from Can, I've been in Cologne. I worked with Francois Gaborkin. I'm over in New York as rap starts and all that. And then I start to muck up with drinking drugs. And before I know it, I'm driving a tube train. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It's, well, it's brilliant. Well, it's brilliant. Know, it's, so there's yeah. you. Tell us about your favourite experience driving on London Underground. What's your What's your favourite experience as a musician? Of all the many people that you've worked with and different setups, different situations, what's the one that you look back on and think, I was very fortunate? Oh, it's a Pharaoh Sanders. So Pharaoh Sanders come and, and worked on Heaven and Earth album. And it was produced with Bill Laswell. Bill always says it was a joint production. He was producing it, you know, really. I, I, you know, it was so easy. He'd make it so easy. But Pharaoh came in, this legendary guy. You get another taciturn kind of guy. A lot of read player. My father-in-law was a great read player. He's dead now. And they've, they've all got a bit grumpy, read players. Whereas trumpet players, a bit more ebullient. There's something about trumpeters. Read players, a little bit complex individuals at times. You know, that's a polite word for it. But he was really, uh, you know, had, had a real weight about him. And that was just, it's a very heavy track called Gone to Croatan. He played on it and it just really, um, just incredible. One take, every take, one take. He did flutes, he did, he did, um, I think, tenor and Elbo sax, I think, on it. Just incredible, you know, with incredible musicians. And my old mate, Angus McKinnon, who was the NME, you're great, right? Um, oh, yeah, we knew him, yeah. We, yeah, we'd done an interview. He still makes to this day, me and him. You know, we've been mates a long time. He would say to me, listen, you need to get to New York. You should be working with Bill Laswell. You should be working with New York musicians. That's that's your station in life is to do that. And I used to, oh, I don't, I'm not going to do that. Well, suddenly, something, something, I've ended up over there, played on a lot of records with Bill. And um, that, that, that day, I come out the studio, got a cassette, um, and when walking through Manhattan, it's 95. I've been clean and sober at that point for um, nine years. And you just feel you've reached a certain point where you would have been if you hadn't self-destructed with booze and drugs. So it was a wonderful, I walked on air and I loved Manhattan at that time. So I'd say that was the real moment, you know. Right, right, right. So, so the that, moments that you're known for, the, you know, things like public image, they, they weren't the happiest times, were they? Because, I mean, there's a detail about your time in public image. You say that you had no manager or agent, and I think you only did 20 shows in two I years. Think we did less, I think we did less than 20 shows. I was, re- oh, I was really fed up with it. It's like, let's, let's just go and work. Let's go and do shows. Let's record. Let's do something. But it was a terrible sort of lethargy in the group quite early on. You know, it really was. It was it was a band that what it was not without issues. You know, um, you know, and I mean, three of the weirdest people you could come across. To be fair, really, you know, there's another way of seeing it is if we had if we'd had proper management, proper financial control, and and a record company that was in some way paternal, we probably wouldn't have been allowed to make metal box to be fair, you know, we wouldn't have made fodder stomp. So that's the other side to the coin. There was a sort of, it was, it, and it was just very extreme. So very dark elements to it, you know, with, with, with Public Image Limited at that time. But also, you know, like, so even, even as I really was fed up with it, with, with John and Keith and how they behaved, I didn't like their attitudes, didn't like how they spoke to people, didn't like how they treated people, you know. And remember with John, he's not a geezer. I've not met him through music. I knew John before him. Yeah, so I'm his mate. So I'm not, you know what I'm saying? It yeah, makes a difference. I'm not going to, I'll see you treat someone the wrong way or talk to I'm not, I'm going to let you know. You know, I'm not going to condone it and think, well, he's a big star. I better not say anything. And of course, what you get, in those situations, people were just so afraid to say anything to people, you know, and I thought the way they were behaving and what they were doing was really wrong, you know. Um, Keith obviously had drug issues at the time and, you know, but then again, we were, I was doing gear, I was doing speed, you know, so it's not, I can't 
yet again, I can't kind of completely look down my nose at them. And I come to mess up anyway myself, so I can't pin any of that on them. But it, but it was a very dynamic band. And to be fair, even towards the end, when I'm really fed up with it doing Metal Box, when we're in the studio, that transcended everything. And John's lyrics with Metal Box, I think it more like, I'm reading a fantastic book called Beetle Bone at the moment about John Lennon going to, to to Ireland, you know, it, it, it's a f- fiction, this wonderful book. And the prose is so Irish. It gets like sort of, you know, like James Joyce, it's like Ulysses, it just flows. Samuel Beckett, there's a real, something so deep there. And John's lyrics with Metal Box, for me, they're not lyrics, they're prose. It's more like Samuel Beckett, mm. you know. So you've got this really special. So would I swap any of it or go back in time and change anything? I wouldn't. I accept them. You know, you just have like, that's how they were, you know. And I was in it for a while. And then I, I, I decided to go, it's fine. And we did something with Metal Box that it it took a lot of years for it to dawn on me how special it was, you know, um, and, and it, how deep it was. So. I wouldn't change any of it. It was very real. It was very dynamic. The, the, the group business side of things was terrible. You know, Harry, it was, you know, it was, it was, it was terrible. So I waited to go to America before leaving. And then I was determined because I was even having trouble getting my 60 quid a week wage. So I went around the house and kind of stormed in there and got the money out, which was kept in a shoebox. <laughs> Literally in high denomination, took <laughs> that, it's quite a bit of money, and then thought, What should I do? I'll go back to America, to show me girlfriend what, what America's like. So I went back to America with shoebox of money and hired a Thunderbird and went coast to coast in America, you know, because I loved America so much. But so I, it's mixed feelings, but I don't feel I don't have an axe to grind with it. it I, I wouldn't change anything because you, if you did, you might not have got metal box to be fair. You know, sure. so you you must have been very gratified when a publisher came and wanted to do this again. And because many musicians write one autobiography, but it's not often that the publisher comes back and says, "Let's do an expanded edition." Did you feel yeah, well, I, validated by that? Yeah, I'm really happy it's out. It was cathartic writing it. I did the. I've only just finished the Audible book today. Went back to t- do the last bits of touch-ups with the Audible book. My taxi was hit by another car on the way oh, back thanks. to do the podcast. That was all. I was very. I thought I was the voice of reason that calmed everything down. <laughs> and I said to my driver, "No, get all the details. We've got time. Don't worry." And I was. And, and I, I've, I'm being self-sacrificing because I had. If that hadn't have happened, I would have had time to get a bacon sandwich from over the road to where I'm staying and I couldn't do that and it was like no it's okay I can put my own needs last no worries you know but um, I think Harry it's very unusual to get another bite of the cherry and the reason is I've got the rights back right the first time round that's it you know which is another story but it all turned out good got the rights back and so it's uh, yet again God you know the universe whatever you want to call it is, is really looking after me you know, right. um, and there's a there's a feeling everything comes together. Everything make as you get older, everything kind of makes sense in the narrative, and that's why I'm very very lucky. And it's down to normally at the big companies there'll be one person or two people that get it. And um, I think the guy Dan, uh, you know, Dan at Favors, he really I think he's involved with a lot of the music books. He's a music freak. So he really understands it, you know. And of course, John Savage, who's a very good friend of mine, you know, you John the forward as well. He? That's right. And John would Love have said it. to people, you know, John would have said to people, "Look, this is a good book. It's worth kind of doing again." You know. Yeah. yeah so yeah, I'm like very. You know. John Bunyan pilgrimage, doesn't he? He's the one who talks about it being a morality. Yeah. It's really. Yeah, good. yeah, I guess it. Yeah, I guess it is a very straightforward story where you you become very lost and you kind of found. And you find your way again. It is straightforward mm. in that sense, you know. And and then the like I've said to a few people already. Yeah, I don't care if you just finish the original book. Finished with me moving up north, and then it finishes with me walking up in the hills, which I love to do. Just this Cockney bloke with a walking staff, not stick staff, and a cap on, like some country bloke in Cheshire up in the, in the hills, and uh, and and. I said, you know, that's how it finishes with me sort of talking to the sheep. You know, all right, that's and um, 
I've said to people, if you, you can fend it there, you don't need to do because the, all, there's a big extended afterward, just catching up on what's happened up, you know, from that point with a new family and everything else, you know, um, moving up north and, um, you know, basically I've developed as an artist as well, all that kind of stuff in that last chapter. If it, that's, I've said to people, if that's a, that might be a bit, you know, by the, the redemption's happened by then if you don't mm. need to read it. You know, well, it's, of, it's course, but of course for me now, that's the best section because that's the thing I'm in now. You know? Yeah, right. sure. Well, it's, uh, you know, the whole story is, is rich in incident and, uh, and, uh, and anecdote and extraordinary experiences. It really is fantastic. It's you know? a really good it's, book. It's really good. Lovely uh, to talk to you as well. Yeah.